So let's get started. Um, right now, the FCC is, is currently contemplating this hybrid approach where the FCC is going to seek to invoke some sort of Title II light, whatever that means, on the termination side of the market. Um, so that is, and the termination, as George said, is the transaction between broadband providers and edge providers. But retail service, I'm not sure how this is going to work, will remain somehow a Title I service and lightly regulated. Okay. As a general matter, classifying, classifying a broadband as a Title II service is a radical reversal of the last two decades of, of bipartisan policy. And it raises a tremendous amount of complex legal issues. So, so let's just sort of getting in. Um, and I'll start with Chris. Let's say the FCC reclassifies. How do you get, how do you think a court's going to look at the reversal of brand X? So I think after Fox, a court is going to look at the reversal of brand X is saying this is the logical culmination of Chevron. I think Chevron has really changed over the years and invites this sort of thing. I, I, let me remind you first that Chevron involved the Reagan administration's radical reversal of a Carter administration policy having to do with the meaning of stationary source. Uh, and up until then, everybody thought a stationary source was a pipe that emitted pollutants. And the Reagan administration got what I thought was a very creative and good idea to have a bubble approach where you could treat an entire factory as one stationary source. Now, this was not the most logical reading of the statute. Nobody thought it was. But they had a good policy reason for thinking that uh, doing an overall pollutant uh, uh, control program rather than each and every pipe would be much more efficient and effective for a variety. And so, Rod said, um, you don't have to, an agency doesn't have to have the best interpretation of the statute. It simply has to have a permissible one. And frankly, policy reasons are a perfectly good justification for doing so. If the Reagan administration has a different sort of view than the Carter administration, that's not, that's not bad. We live in a democracy, and, and they ought to be able to experiment. And then there's been... Courts of Appeals have been very slow to sort of fully grasp all of this. Again, under the Chevron framework, it just has to be a permissible reading of the statute, in that case, the meaning of the word, word indecency. So in Brand X, of course, you had a 6-3 decision, and you had three justices led by Justice Scalia saying the only reasonable interpretation of this statute is that uh, broadband is a is a telecom service, uh, so it's not even permissible to classify it otherwise. And he had six justices who said, "Not nah, it's permissible to call it an information service." No, none of them seemed to think it was, you know, mandatory to call it that. So um, let me now make my disclaimer: uh, it, it's worse than being. Uh, for the government like it used to be in private practice when you have many clients who have many nuanced views on, on, on issues like this. So I'm not saying that reclassification is a good thing or a bad thing or anything, but I predict that a court will uphold it. And indeed, if my only goal were to defend a regulation of the Internet, I would think that, that was actually the best way to go about it. I agree with you, Chris, completely on the law. I think you're right that in light of Fox and in light of Scalia's dissent in Brand X, you could write a defensible uh, reclassification. But as I learned when I worked at the FCC, writing a clean order is a challenge. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the FCC um, in Brand X, the, the analysis they've used is based in large part on sort of facts about how the people experience the Internet. And I guess my view is, although in theory, they could write a great order that could be upheld. It's going to be very challenging given the people involved and the politics and the facts they've already relied upon to write a clean order that, that survives. I'm not saying it's impossible. I agree with you, but I think it's hard. Sorry for interrupting you, Brian. So I, I agree with that. I think, so I hope you're wrong, Chris, um, because I don't think it's the right approach for the country for policy reasons. 
uh, I think there are three problems that I see. One is classification and open internet are two different decisions, right? So, and they've gotten very much conflated. We, we arrived at Brand X uh, as a classification decision based on the nature of the internet. We can say that there were policy reasons why we got there, but it was a clean classification decision that was then followed by a series of decisions by the Martin administration uh, on wireless, uh, broadband over power line, and uh, telco broadband, right? So there are four different orders that distinguish this stuff. Here, we have the President of the United States making a, a policy pronouncement about where he wants to get on open internet, and oh, by the way, the way to get there is to suddenly discover new facts about the way broadband is offered to consumers. I think that should trouble most courts, um, that, that we are, it is so clearly conflated with a policy goal, this classification issue. The second issue is the one that, that Sam just mentioned, which is this is supposed to be a factual inquiry about the nature of the integration between the information services and the underlying telecommunications offering to individual consumers. For all of us who practice in this space, we've spent uh, tons of billable hours over the last decade advising clients about when something's on this side of the information services line or that side of the information services line, particularly as it's assessed for universal service, et cetera. Those lines are highly particularized based on the service offering to cons that a company comes up with. Unless you're going to do a million different assessments about the kinds of broadband internet access services that are offered to individual consumers, I'm not sure how you reach a sweeping conclusion about what's an information service versus what's a telecommunication service. And I'm not sure how you get to new facts consistent with what Sam was saying that somehow suggests it's less integrated than it was in 2005. I think there's a lot of evidence, particularly on the wireless side, that it is more integrated than it was in 2005. And third and finally, the Fox Court talked about reliance interests. And one of the things that the Martin Commission talked about in all four of its orders was this idea that these decisions were designed to spur people to invest in these networks. And we have seen an extraordinary level of investment uh, in our broadband infrastructure over the course of the last decade reliant on these decisions. 30 billion plus from the wireless industry, 75 billion plus from the um, wireline broadband industry. Uh, AT&T and Verizon invested more than all three of the top uh, car companies combined uh, and more than the oil and gas industry, I think, uh, over the last year. Uh, it's a breathtaking record of success, so it is hard not to get to the reliance point here. So I like to think that those three factors will weigh heavily against the court um, finding, reaching the conclusion that Chris described. I agree if this was a, if this was a clean reclassification play and this was eight years ago, uh, that we might be in a different place. I don't think that's where we are, and I hope that's not where we are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of things. First of all, um, I agree with what Sam said in the sense of it's really hard to write a clean order. I, I would say it's impossible because, uh, uh, because of the personalities within, a, within the building, the personalities and the idea, ideologies of, uh, among the commissioners. Everyone wants to try to put their stamp in a particular order. Uh, but in this particular case, if it's a Title II classification, you're only going to have three commissioners working on it. There will not be five. So um, I think that makes it a little bit easier uh, to come up with something that's clean because if this is the way that the FCC goes, uh, they will be like-minded and they will be, and already are, frankly, very sensitive to challenge. Um, but I, I think I'll be a little bit radical and I will say I am not entirely sure that the chairman slash uh, policy thinkers are leaning toward the hybrid approach. I have gotten the impression that uh, there is some thinking about how difficult Title II would be. So I'll tell, I'll credit the Phoenix Center and all of their studies. Um, but there is, from the conversations that I've had, a little bit of um, nervousness on the part of some of the policymakers in the thinking about what. Uh, obviously there will be a challenge. And some think that the uh, Section 706 approach is more legally sustainable. Um, uh, who knows? I mean, having been up there and we've all worked at the FCC, uh, sometimes opinions change, sometimes something new happens, 
but I, I personally am not entirely sure that um, hybrid Title II is on the table. I, 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 let me rephrase that. It's on the table, but I'm not sure that it's, um, it's the only option on the table. Let's explore. Yes. Yep. Let's explore some more of those legal complications, shall we? <laughs> um, one of the things that, that strikes me, I think a lot of people are overlooking, is the the three, Section three thirty two problem for wireless. You know, Congress set out a very clear statute for wireless, where we have CMRS and private radio, and you have a the FCC decides to reclassify mobile broadband that may run into that 332 problem. So let me start with uh, Brian. Why don't you, do you have any thoughts on the 332 issue? Uh, I agree. It creates an independent problem for wireless. Uh, the statute talks about uh, CMRS being interconnected, uh, and the commission has defined that by rule to mean using the North American numbering plan, I believe. Uh, you know, there's talk about they could do a further notice to change the definition of what interconnected means, and they've talked about trying to you know, there's a lot of sort of hoops they'd have to jump through, but it's pretty hard to get to the point where you contend that um, wireless is CMRS, and it would also open a bit of a Pandora's box and a host of other issues uh, that the commission has previously avoided by, by classifying wireless broadband as, as private land mobile radio services, private mobile radio services. So it is an independent bar. I think there's a host of other bars that are unique to the wireless arena, including how much more competitive it is, but it is a, a unique uh, problem for them when it comes to that particular uh, platform. Yeah, I, I, agree, with, I agree with Brian. I, I don't think this is a, a, a barrier that, that they can't get past. I think it's a pretty big barrier, though, and given the consequences, I think like everything else, the justification and all the things they'd have to undo um, is a minefield, again, that a, a court would have uh, real problems with. And just to go back to the, to just follow up on my friend Sam, it, it, it is another problem and it's yet another contortion to get to a political result for open internet where we're not that far apart about what we think the rules should be. I mean, the irony is that as this debate has evolved, uh, there is some differentiation about what people think the paid prioritization regime should be or, or what have you. But at the end of the day, the, the world has largely converged around what the four principles are. And we are talking about a, a um, incredible contortionist act to get to that result and I just find it hard to imagine that a court is going to find that compelling when there's such a transparent political purpose at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, but I also think they're kind of, uh, they don't have any good options, right? I mean, whatever they do uh, is going to be hard fought in court and it's going to be a challenge to uphold. So um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to their plight. I'm really glad that I'm not the one that has to make this decision. <laughs> But let me just make the point that, you know, wireless is clearly legally different. Uh, more importantly, I think it's economically different, uh, that sort of in the real world it's different. And, and, and I also think that that's what really ought to matter. And, and on some level, then it all comes down to um, uh, the meaning of unreasonable discrimination, I think. And, and, and um, you know, in neither 332 nor under a forbearance regime for Title II is the commission allowed to permit unreasonable discrimination. You can't forbear from Section 202 or Section 201 for that matter. Right. But um, I'll bet you we all think that unreasonable discrimination uh, doesn't prohibit the things we think ought to be allowed and, and does prohibit the things right. we ought not be allowed. And, we may or may not have different views on that, but um, but on some general level, it's hard to say I'm for unreasonable discrimination. Yes. But but George's invocation of Orloff earlier was very compelling uh, because I think it, it goes to the very core of this, which is that it upheld discrimination. In that case, as I recall, it was uh, cutting people deals, individual wireless deals over the phone when they called to complain about their bill, and it was in the court held that we were fine in Orloff. I think yeah. wait, most of us were there for Orloff. Um, and so it is, I think that's a perfect example, as George invoked, of what discrimination means in, a, in, a, in that context. So is it possible to write a legally sustainable rule that bans pay prioritization? I mean, it's clearly lawful under Title II. I'm mean, just, by the way, from my own background, before I became a telecom lawyer, I was an electric utility lawyer, so I've actually litigated rate cases. Which I'm not proud of my rate-making you know, background, but I have one. 
And, you know, the, the JNR standard and undue discrimination standard, I mean, you know, there's 60, 70, 80 years of case law on this stuff. And it just strikes me that, you know, reasonable discrimination is perfectly lawful. JNR is a cost-based standard, right? It's not affordable. It's got to be within the zone of reasonable. It can't be confiscatory. It can't be ex excessive. I mean, how do you write a rule that bans this when even under, when the case law and the statute clearly permits it? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I, I think it's a good argument, but I think the law of the statute, the statute's not entirely clear, right? What is just and reasonable discrimination? And yes, you're right, there's 100 million years of history that it means X and Y, but, you know, to Chris's earlier point, they can just say, we read the statute differently now. They have to explain, this is where I think it gets hard, why paid prioritization is unjust and unreasonable. They have to come up with some kind of a reasonable, good explanation, but I think they, in theory, they can do it. Well, my favorite rate-making case, Farmers Union versus Central Exchange, uh, the phase just and reasonable is not a mere vessel into which meaning must be poured. Um, classic rate case, but I developed like the old rate case. So, hey, well, uh, very, yeah, let, let me just throw in uh, another political point, perhaps. But you know, we're the, the D.C. Circuit is now seven to four Democratic appointees. Yeah, this is this is an unappreciated shift. No, uh, I none of us have been lawyers while the Democratic uh, w w w when there was a Democratic majority right. D.C. Circuit. Um, if you follow the Helbig case involving, uh, you know, Obamacare, it's excellent point. You, you'd, you'd know that this is a D.C. Circuit that has different views than the D.C. Circuit did last year at this time. Right. All right. Well, let, what about the states? I mean, you know, we keep forgetting that the states have a role here, uh, whatever that is. And, you know, we're going to have the FCC define Internet broadband access as, you know, what are they going to do? Declare it as an exclusive federal service, which is what I guess we tried to do in the FCC tried to do in the Pulver order, saying you know that was for those of us who've been doing this VoIP stuff long enough. I mean, remember the whole Title One, Title Two stuff was to keep access charges in the states off of VoIP. You know when we started this, uh, but now you're going to have your Title Two service. The states are going to get involved. They clearly have an involvement given the the way the statute 706 is written. What does the FCC do? Do they, do they declare that it's federal? Is there some state component? Do we have an inter, intrastate broadband access? How is, how is this supposed to work? Angela, do you have any clue? I, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you. I really don't. Except to say that I can't imagine that the states would not want to also regulate uh, if the FCC is going to regulate. And to me, you know, the good news is the states will have a role the bad news is the states will have a role. Uh, there are some states that are very laissez-faire when it comes to telecom, reg telecom regulation. Uh, there are some states where uh, a, 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 a OTT service does not need to be certificated, for example. So um, perhaps in, in those types of states, uh, it will, uh, FCC action will nonetheless mean status quo. But I, look, I mean, this is such a rich source of income. Uh, we, it's no secret here. States are cash-strapped. Uh, this is sort of a Christmas tree to, oh, you know, I bet it's my fifth interference. I got my license to buy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we're right next to the Russian embassy, so I, I believe I believe the communists are behind it. They, they've heard about the title they've, two. They've heard yeah. about title two, and they're all excited. <laughs> we're bringing it back. <laughs> so, yeah. So, in any event, I just think, in practical terms, that states will want to engage at a minimum because this will be a uh, potential uh, universal service contributor, a potential tax. Uh, entity, and um, I, I, and furthermore, I, I'm not even sure that the FCC will opine one way or another. I think that they already have uh, too many political issues on their hands here, and I suspect that the, the order will be silent. Well, and one really inconvenient fact about this for purposes of the Commission's efforts, if they try to keep the states out, is that I, some ungodly high percentage, and I think the number I've seen is 80 or 85 percent, of broadband traffic is actually intrastate because of the role of CDNs and, and so much content has been pushed closer to consumers 
that does not have the traditional uh, as a higher percentage of interstate as it once did, um, on the particularly on the uh, consumer broadband internet access side. So it, there are some inconvenient facts here also that, that are going to create problems for them. Yeah, I, I think those are, those are both good points. I mean, I think the states will certainly try to regulate it. I guess, Angela, I disagree with you a little bit. I think they're going to have to say something about the state regulation because it's such a it's such a big issue in terms of their argument that they wanted to maintain the status quo but be under under Title II. And I, I believe that the, that the third way, as it was called by Chairman Janikowski, that was floated had some preemption in mind. But to me, I think there's just going to be massive legal battles around the, that preemption and what's preempted, the scope of preemption. And, and to me, that is one of the biggest problems with this is that it's going to be years of uncertainty and fighting about all kinds of aspects. There are also things that it's not clear the FCC can um, can preempt. So it, it just, I think we have a lot of, a lot of battles on our hands. Well, I've, I've always loved preemption. My, my first telecom case was, was Louisiana Public Service Commission. Oh, nice. So, the, um, and, and of course the, uh, the Iowa Utilities Board case, the, uh, uh, I got beat up by the Eighth Circuit judges who said that Section 2B is hog tight, horse high, and bull strong <laughs> until corrected by the Supreme Court. Um, but, but here, you, you know, I, I don't know that it's that well developed the law, but but I think the FCC can can preempt. I think uh, uh, forbearance presumes that there's a federal policy that it is unnecessary to um, uh, have certain kinds of regulation, and therefore the FCC can declare that it's contrary to the federal scheme if states come in and regulate something the FCC has forborne from. And similarly, I think you can the FCC ought to be able to prevail on arguments that it's line drawing on what is uh, 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 just and reasonable and what is uh, um, unreasonable discrimination ought to, ought to prevail and not permit states to depart from it. But, but I'll admit it would be a nice, there, 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 there'd certainly be some nice appellate litigation involved. Well, well, let's talk quickly about forbearance and then we'll get to preemption. Um, the FCC, again, you know, has stated that is essentially defined the relevant geographic market for the open internet proceeding is essentially each individual broadband service provider. It's the relevant market isn't like, you know, the CMRS market. It's not a local franchise area. It's I'm dominant over myself. Um, and the FCC, having done several forbearance papers this year, I mean, we poured over the case. I mean, the commission has never granted forbearance or de-tariffing in the face of dominance. Um, now, that's not to say using, you know, Chris's argument that, well, you know, with Fox, you know, as long as there's, we, we can sort of change our mind on anything. But what strikes me is that this summer, the FCC, or actually two years ago, the FCC, and they just did the data re uh, request this summer, um, suspended special access deregulation because they said two firms is insufficient to create a competitive pricing. So let me ask the panel this. Can the FCC get around this forbearance precedent that it has? Because it's always held this, that you've got to have some inkling of competition. And then if they do decide to get around it and create this new precedent. How is that going to affect going forward? Is the court going to go, wait a minute, you just did this. How does that affect here? So, Sam, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, you know, I, I think, Larry, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think it will be difficult for the, for the commission. Um, as, as you mentioned, I think they... It's, a, it's another contortion they'd have to make to explain why this is different. And to Brian's point, it all starts looking, looking a bit fishy. I think it depends in part of whether we're talking about uh, full reclassification or hybrid. I think if we're talking about just changing the way the relationship between the edge and the broadband provider are regulated, there would be price regulation there, right? They wouldn't forbear from that. They'd set a, some zero rate or something. Right. So I think forbearing from other aspects of it probably wouldn't be that difficult. I think it gets much harder if you're talking about full cre reclassification and you're going to forbear from price regulation on the retail yeah, side. Yeah, we're not talking about like using forbearance to get rid of armist data. We're talking about, you know, 201, <laughs> 202, know too, 203. Right. You're, but you're not going to get rid of 201. I mean, you're not going to get rid of 201 or 202. Henry Waxman wants to. Henry Waxman wants to. He, he, he may want to, but they need to set, if, if, if the whole point of this is to set a zero pricing or get rid of paid prioritization, you, you're going to need those right. provisions. So. I mean, isn't that the irony of it, though? Yes. Yeah. Because you, you, we're going to keep 201, 202, and 208, and this is a market in and of itself with each individual provider being a monopolist. But we're also going to forbear because each individual monopolist really isn't that much of a monopolist. Right. 
So I, I, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know if that's me now or not. Uh, I do commend uh, your November paper on this topic. It's very well done. I also uh, applaud you for getting the Phoenix forbearance order to be so central to this discussion for the Phoenix Center. That was very well done. Right. Uh, excellent right. branding job. <clears throat> but I, your paper underscores the larger problem here. And when we, when we looked at the third way in 2010, if you look at the record in that docket, um, yes, I think that the commission at that point proposed six of the provisions of, of Title II to apply, but advocates uh, up that number, at least at the proposed level, to something on the order of 20. It is pretty easy to see why this trench warfare is so difficult for them, because if you really have to make the kind of finding that the Section 10 requires, uh, and the recent D.C. Circuit case in the, in the uh, Verizon forbearance context illustrates this, it is very, very difficult, and you will have a lot of advocates coming in uh, making very specific points about individual provisions, and this clean forbearance is going to be a lot harder to achieve than I think um, certainly the president's video indicated, uh, and I think uh, than many advocates are prepared to concede at this point. Well, let me say that George, uh, one of our most creative lawyers, uh, uh, created a new idea in my mind with, with one of his slides where I saw what seems to be sort of an obvious parallel between intercarrier compensation reform with the uh, sort of a rural LEC having a, 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 um, a, a monopoly over its customers. And, you know, the FCC uh, adopted bill and keep, and the Tenth Circuit has upheld it. And um, but There was carrier to carrier. Uh, well, and if you're talking edge provider, um, uh, broadband provider, it's that seems sort of analogous to me. Um, but uh, well, let, me ask, let me ask the other panelists a question. I... I uh, well, 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 well um, sort of being nice and, and saying, acknowledging that there's, you know, an ability to change. Uh, let, let's suppose the FCC adopts, let's suppose it adopts a rule that we all think is too regulatory. Uh, and it's uh, now 2017 and Rand Paul is president. Can he just say, I want the FCC to get rid of all those uh, Obama rules and, uh, and, and adopt, uh, and adopt uh, my a, a complete deregulation and do so immediately? No, because those rules would have already been struck down by the courts. <laughs> nice. well, I'm not answering your hypothetical. <laughs> but, it, but it does underscore the problem, right? Because, and that's why reliance interests and change facts to me become particularly relevant here, because you, you just, that can't be the way we run the country. I mean, maybe it is going to be the way we run the country, but I certainly hope not that we're going to bounce back and forth between Title II and Title I, depending on who's in the White House. That strikes me as not what this was supposed to be, how this, the Administrative Procedure Act is supposed to work. And I would assume that we will be more sensible than that as a country and do something that avoids that result. Um, I also think, by the way, just for whatever it's worth, that there are many legislative solutions to this problem. We could pass an open internet bill tomorrow and make it under Title I, and everyone could agree to the rules more or less, and we could be done. So I, I think there's a lot of ways around this that avoid some of the torture that we've all uh, described this morning. Well, as, as I've turned into a panelist here, I would commend you reading our, our paper on, on the politicization on, in, in investment where firms need to make long-term investments and they can't have one administration change radically to the next. You need some degree of consistency, which is why, as we as lawyers, respect concepts like stare decisis and res judicata and, and understand that there's a long, unbroken chain we don't want to be the last link. Right. But, but, so, but Larry, I mean, uh, uh, nobody laughed at Brian's uh, point that, you know, Congress can actually inject certainty into this uh, position. Uh, this is the lawyer's panel. panel. We're talking policy because, next we panel. Know that, we, we get the politicians next panel. In, in a Chevron world after right. Fox, I don't think there is administrative certainty. And, I, and I'm not even sure it's a Well, that's a legitimate value. point. I mean, that's, that's an important point. Um, and, and that's sort of thing that what everybody talks about generally about the state of administrative law altogether. I mean, I, I won't say who, but a certain uh, Columbia prof law professor, I was all at a panel, said, well, you know, this thing can just change its mind. But I, I'm not sure that's a good idea that you just keep changing your mind. But that, that's for us. Well, you can, sh an agency can change its mind, right, and but that's it has okay to, to give adapt. a right. full right. explanation. Right. And I, I think Ryan and I and perhaps others are saying the facts, if anything, have gone in the opposite direction. All right. Well, let's let's quickly turn to preemption, but it, not the preemption we were talking about in terms of Title II, but um, as a former uh, FCC general counsel recently remarked in a speech a couple months ago, um, the FCC, and I quote, pretty much rolled out the red carpet, close quote, 
uh, for the city of Chattanooga to file a preemption proceeding on state municipal broadband laws. Um, we know the agency is precluded under the Supreme Court's holding in, in Nixon from using Section 253. So I assume that when Chairman Wheeler talks about I have the power and I intend to exercise that power, he's talking about some theory under Section 706. So my question to the panel is, do we know what that theory is? And B, do we think that it would succeed? So, Sam? Um, I, I assume the theory is under 706 or some combination of things. I, I don't think it would succeed. I mean, I think you're right that the Supreme Court precedent is only narrowly focused on a certain statute and wouldn't, by its own terms, necessarily decide the issue. But I think there's a longstanding um, notion in the Supreme Court, which was recognized in that case, that states have discretion to order their affairs and subdivisions of states are considered part of the state. And so if, if your state says cities aren't supposed to do X, I think the Supreme Court is going to have a hard time saying the FCC can, can undo that. And I think as um, in the Supreme Court case, I think it was pointed out, well, what if the state doesn't give any money for this municipal? Bro I mean, it just it opens up a whole can of worms and I think turns a longstanding tradition of state authority. So I, I, don't, I don't think it works. Oh, yeah. Uh, I completely agree, and it's also bad public policy. I just I think there's a, states should be allowed to decide what they, their municipalities can and can't do. The checkered history of unique broadband deployment is, is further underscores this point, and uh, I, I don't see how it, it survives court review. I agree. Chris. Um, all right, and, and so for le my last series of questions, I'd like to talk about what it's like to be a practicing lawyer um, in the current environment. Um, we have seen a remarkable change in advocacy uh, before the FCC over the 20 years that I've been practicing. Um, this dramatic rise of, of collectivism. I mean, it is, it was a 3.7 million comments and counting. You have the President of the United States actually actively encouraging collectivism. Um, the phrase I came up with, I think we're sort of now, it's sort of administrative law vigilantism, where it's, you know, well, will the people, well, what about the law? And I get the impression from the commission that it is a real sort of lack of respect of sort of precedent and sort of following the APA. And let me ask you guys as, as lawyers, what do you think about this? I mean, is it, is it tough to give your clients regulatory advice when, when there's sort of this, you don't know whether to sit or go blind? You, how do we practice in this new environment? Is it good for public policy? I'll, I'll start with you, Angela. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's both. I think it's it's good on on this in the sense of you're having uh, a larger number of people participate and engage in the process, and I I personally think that that's a good thing. Um, on the other hand, it's it's too good because look at what happened to the FCC system. Now, obviously, the system has its faults. It's old. It's you know. 15 generations behind, but it is what it is. And the irony is that it, the whole system crashed it, and it affected the public's ability to see what has been on file, not just in the net neutrality proceeding, but also in other proceedings. I mean, I found myself having to call the secretary's office to say, I'm looking for X, Y, Z and docket, you know, an OET docket. And they, they uh, had to manually find that. And that's not fair because I knew who to call. It's not fair to people that, you know, don't have that ability to find something that they're looking for. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, and we've all worked at the FCC, um, decision making is supposed to be dispassionate. And uh, it is supposed to consider the facts and the law and you know, come up with uh, sound policy rationale. Um, I, but I, you know, this particular issue, there is no such thing as dispassion. Uh, it's just you know, it's crazy time. And uh, I, December 2010 was probably the worst month in my professional career. It was very, very challenging to be in that environment um, with you know, all of the passion all around. Brian? Uh, so I guess a couple things. Uh, participation is good, and we should encourage uh, the American people to be involved just as we encourage 
Ukrainians to be involved and, and oppressed people around the world. The, the power of the internet is something that the companies in our sector have created, and it is an externally, for, externally positive force for good, and that's true whether it's in, around the world or in the United States. So participation is good. I think it has changed the way advocacy needs to work uh, in Washington. Uh, I think that it's a reflection of how integral our sector has become to the American people that we've engendered this kind of passion. Uh, and I think that our advocacy needs to catch up with the role we play in society. And I think that, you know, 15 years ago, I don't think that, that people, um, it wasn't as easy because the internet didn't exist or it didn't exist in the same form. And the, our sector wasn't as important to everyday lives of all Americans. And now that we are in that role, uh, we have to rise to the occasion to educate the American people about, so that they're as passionate about the views of our clients as they are about maybe about our clients' opponents. And that's going to be hard. Uh, but it is, a, it is a tried and true element of whether it's SOAP and PIPA or immigration reform or uh, the environment. We see it across the political sector. It's not unique to us that, um, that activism via the Internet is encouraged and part of the political process. And we have to step up our game to be a part of that dialogue or um, our companies and our clients will consistently lose. So I think that's the, that's the challenge we have, and it's, it's, a, it, it's a large one, but it is a, one of our own creation because we've been so successful. Americans use the Internet more than any other people in the world. I think second only to South Korea, and we'll soon overpass, uh, surpass them. Uh, that's an incredible record of accomplishment, but with it comes uh, this degree of engagement in our policy process, and we need to make sure that our advocacy adapts to that. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I also think, uh, for me, I think it's, I, I'm really enjoying practicing this environment, I've got to say. Like, I think this is the most interesting time at the FCC that I can remember, at least since the triennial review, and that was really Ooh, unpleasant. That was, oh, <laughs> that was awful. Uh, good times. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I just think these are really important, weighty issues that really could go in a lot of different directions, and I feel like uh, it's a great environment to be practicing and, and trying to make a difference. So it's an interesting fact if a whole lot of people make the same one-page comment, yeah. but I, I certainly don't think decision makers at the FCC ought to give a whole lot of weight to that. I, I, I don't think they do. In some ways, I worry more about the kind of constant refrain that has been in orders as long as I've been involved in the FCC, where sometimes the FCC thinks it's really relevant that 17 commenters favored X and only six favored Y, um, which, you know, it's so, the way of the evidence, Chris. So, so, yeah, something like that can be interesting if it's, you know, 17 groups representing a whole variety of, mm -hmm. of industries and stuff. But if they're just, you know, if there's 17 types of one variety of, of commenter and six types of the others, it says, you know, absolutely nothing. And, 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 I, and I'm, I don't know if the world's gotten worse or not. Judge Posner wrote a great decision in the, in the early 90s, sort of, he was appalled by the commission for thinking that its job was not to choose the right answer among several proposals made to it, but sort of manage conflict between all of these children who come to it seeking favors. And, um, and I, I wish I could give you a cite, but that's, that's, that, that was a, that's a fun uh, opinion to read. Well, um, it is now um, about 10, 37. So I tell you what, I want to thank my panels for an excellent discussion. I appreciate you all coming down, particularly on a cold and rainy day. We're going to take about an eight minute, eight, nine minute um, break, networking break, have some coffee, and then we'll set up for our uh, policy panel and uh, Senator Fisher. So thank you again to the panel and uh, enjoy some coffee, everybody. <laughs>